good to go. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. This is talk two of our um, two talk series for the Salem Center of Causal Inference Seminar. We had a frequentist earlier in the day, and we're going to finish strong with the Bayesian now. Uh, Ken Macklin uh, also did a postdoc with me and with Sam, and he's going to be talking about Bayesian causal synthesis. Ken, thanks for joining us. All right. Thanks, David. All right. Okay. Uh, well, thanks, David, for the introduction and the invitation. It's been great with us so far. Um, so, yeah, so my talk's on uh, Bayesian causal synthesis for. So we kind of haven't decided on what to call what we're doing. Um, so it's either, either, so in the talk title, it's meta inference, um, but in the archive version, it's called supra inference. Um, yeah, we, I originally thought meta inference was a little bit better because, you know, meta analysis, that's a familiar term, you know, it's an inference version of that. Uh, and then, uh, but then we've found out in causal inference, there's this thing called meta learners. Which is technically isn't that meta, um, and then so yeah, so the super amazing is is a different notation in the literature. So I was like, yeah, super inference, uh, but I, but then some people told me I don't understand what super means, so I'm gonna have to go back to meta inference. Um, it's one of those tiny details that no one cares about unless you're the author of the paper. All right, so uh, so today uh, our focus is going to be heterogeneous treatment effects. Um, this has been something that people have been interested in for a very long time. Uh, right, so classically, when we've done causal inference, we've talked about the average treatment effect, right? So we have a, a big group of people, and then we split it into two randomized, uh, and then we look at the effect of a drug on one, one uh, the effect of the drug on the treatment group compared to the control group. Uh, and in that case, you have a bunch of different groups within that group, right? So you have, um, uh, people from different races with different gender, different, X, Y, Z, and that heterogeneity gets averaged out in the average treatment effect. And there has been a lot of uh, motivation in the complementary literature to sort of um, understand the heterogeneity and then say, why don't we look at the conditional average treatment effect or the HTE under these contexts so we understand that you know, different subgroups, different races, different genders might have different reactions to drugs or interactions to some kind of treatment effect or, or some kind of intervention, right? And I bring up this paper uh, that uh, uh, Carlos wrote uh, with Richard and other, a few other people in Nature, uh, which has been like, cited almost like not a thousand times already or something, pretty nuts. Um, yeah, so this idea of heterogeneity in data has been kind of big and has sort of seen uh, that's a pretty big interest, even outside of the causal inference literature. Um, even though I don't think it has quite caught up by it. All right. So in general, we talk about heterogeneous treatment effects. So causal inference typically is uh, split into, I would say, um, two paradigms, right? One is the design-based paradigm, and then it's the model-based paradigm. The design-based paradigm is where you say, everything we need to do in terms of estimating the causal effect comes down to how we design our experiments. And if we design our experiments well enough, then we should be able to get an accurate and good uh, average treatment, or not just average, but some kind of treatment effect. Compared to the model-based ones where you say, that's not enough at some point, at, at some times, you can say observational studies, you have to have some kind of modeling assumptions that you impose on the data itself to try to extract the treatment effect. Uh, and then that, that two different paradigms Thing are quite contrastive, and uh, a lot of the HTE methods that have been proposed would fall on the model based side, I'd say, right? So, like, we have linear model assumptions, we have non linear models, additive models, uh, Bayesian causal force, which is big in the Bayesian literature coming out of Texas as well, right? All these things are used a lot in the literature, uh, but they're, more, they're all model based, right? They're not design based, they're all, say, they're all saying. Given this model structure, we could figure the treatment effect um, or, or not, right? And this obviously leads to the problem of model specification bias and uncertainty, right? And when we do uh, causal inference in a model-based framework, obviously the 
the choice of models and even the specification of models in the Bayesian version, even the specification of the priors of the model is going to have a big impact on your, your inference. And that bias and uncertainty in the specification um, is often not considered for a very good reason. Right? So model selection or model ensembling or model averaging um, are, I would say, is not still a big uh, thing that we talk about in the, the literature. So the question is why? Right. So there's a clear, you know, coming from more of a prediction background, I think there's a clear um, reason why this is the case, right? If you, if you contrast prediction and causal inference, right? So difference, the main difference is in predictive tasks, you get immediate direct feedback, right? If I want to have a model or a method I'm proposing, then, and the goal of that method is to predict the inflation next month, then I only need to wait until next month to see if my model or, or whatever I propose actually works or not, right? If it doesn't work, then I'll know next month. If it does work, I know next month. Um, you can't really do this uh, in the causal inference perspective because you never actually observe the true causal inference. Right? You never actually observe the potential outcome. Uh, so if you, if you get a drug, right, you never actually observe the world in which you didn't take that drug, right? And a lot of the model selection ensemble literature relies on this sort of direct feedback, right? So it says, if I want to minimize predictive error, that this kind of model selection strategy is the best, right? And if you don't have the, this kind of prediction is good metric, uh, you're not gonna be able to build all of these model selection or ensemble methods. And this has been, I think, a, a pretty big problem. And, and people have recognized this, right? So for example, causal inference competitions have been a very big thing. Right, so this is the line of causal inference competition. I mean, you don't need to see what it is, but pretty much it's a, it's a blinded uh, competition where everyone gets data and then they submit the causal inference estimate and then they rank them based on how good the quality is. Um, and, and effectively, this is the only way we could figure out which causal inference method is good or, or bad in that specific scenario. Right, and I think the ge general overview um, or the general impression that people, or general takeaway that people come out of it is that uh, this is from a quote from, um, uh, I think this is a general health paper, uh, where it says that overall we find that the surprising degree, we could not go beyond the general recommendation of using flexible non-parametric response service modeling. Um, and that's it, right? There's, there's no one model that does well in every single circumstance. And that seems to be uh, a big, um, big issue because if you know that, like, you know, one could argue that the causal BART stuff has kind of been the flagship in that perspective. But nonetheless, you know, not every method. Not, there's no one method that is good for every situation. And if we don't, uh, given the situation that you have, there's no clear answer uh, which method you should use. All right, so. I work in ensemble methods uh, primarily. So obviously, given the model of the specification problem, the first question I'd ask is, well, can we ensemble, right? Uh, because ensemble methods work really, really well in predictive tasks. The central bank uses ensemble methods. Um, you know, machine learning people in like Kaggle, they use ensemble methods. Pretty much everybody who is working on predictive tasks end up using some type of ensemble methods. So we know that they work really, really well in brackets. Um, so therefore, the natural thing you could ask is, well, should it in principle at least work for causal tasks? Right? The problem is there are, well, I, I, I would say there's at least three problems that make ensemble methods or applying or developing ensemble methods for causal inference tasks particularly difficult. All right, the first thing is that there's no clear target to minimize. Right? So typically in a lot of ensemble methods that are developed, they either use cross-validation or they use some kind of information criteria. But cross-validation and information criteria, they're both predictive metrics, right? Cross-validation saying, I don't have out-of-sample data, so I'm gonna create quasi-out-of-sample data within my in-sample data to mimic this predictive task that I wanna do, right? So it's a predictive task. It's not clear at all whether that predictive task of predicting 
extra data in your in your in your in your data set is actually going to um, link back to your accuracy of the estimation of your causal causal method, right? And same thing with information criteria. So a lot of times it's like it's like trying to hit a watermelon you know, blindfolded, right? It's just it's just an impossible task without any feedback. But this isn't too much cultural context behind this one. Um, but uh, yeah, never mind. Okay. <laughs> the second problem, the second problem is performance heterogeneity, right? And this is somewhat expected, right? Um, if you do, if we, care, if we care about heterogeneous treatment effects, and we're recognizing that one group has X effect, while the, another group has a Y effect, and X is going to be larger than Y, then um, plausibly, the model that you're using one model could be very, very good at modeling the, the effect X, but for Y and vice versa. So this, you're going to see some performance heterogeneity uh, in your heterogeneous treatment. Model. So there's a lot of heter heterogeneity on top of heterogeneity, right? Yeah, so, so one model could be good at modeling the population red, one model could be good at population, uh, modeling the population green, and one model be, could be good at pop, uh, modeling population blue, the treatment effect. Um, and what happens is, if you just use a basic ensemble method, you're averaging out all those things, right? So it's effectively, try, effectively, you're getting the average treatment effect in some sense because you're averaging out the performance of the All right, and finally, uh, there's high dependence on most models or methods, right? Because obviously, you're using the same data to build these HTEs um, and you're using similar assumptions, and you, know, you can tweak things around. You know, they have one version of BART compared to another version of BART. Now, they're different, but a lot of the things that go in and come out are going to be the same, right? So there's going to be high dependence among these um, these methods, and that's going to be a, a problem uh, going down the road. All right. So my question has been, on solving these three problems, can we ensemble from a more foundationally Bayesian perspective? So from a Bayesian perspective, what is the right thing to do in this context? Right. And this leads to my, my main sort of research topic, which is on ensemble methods. So let's just assume that some decision maker is wondering about, let's say, the number of attendants in the seminar. You know, beforehand, they're trying to predict uh, what the number of attendants and, or you know, number of attendants at a football game or something like that, right? And beforehand, they do that, uh, but this decision maker solicits um, three agents. This could be David and Sam and Carlos, right? You know, I guess Carlos would be soliciting the predictions, but it's, you know, and, and, and each one of you will have some predicted distribution about the number of attendants. Uh, let's call that H, H, HX, right? Um, and then you, everyone submits their predictions to the decision maker. And it's the goal of the decision maker to bring all these information together and make a sort of, uh, sort of synthesize this information to make inference as a whole, right? And this, again, this is something that pretty much every uh, high stakes decision making uh, situations do, right? Talk to any central banker, they'll say, we have multiple models, multiple economists. They all say what next month's inflation is gonna be. And then the the chairman of the board is gonna look at it and then say a combination of these or where this, these, these things make sense, they never make decisions based on one model, right? So that's pretty much what people always do in high stakes, uh, high stakes situation. And this is what we're trying to do uh, in this context as well. The problem is, uh, in practice, and this is true for the causal, there's, there's some literature on ensemble methods and causal inference. And this is the same problem that we see in, in predictive um, ensemble methods is usually people do a simple average. Right? They just take the average of all the methods. Right? Um, that, that actually gets you pretty far because uh, simple averages tend to do, do fairly well. Right? But a lot of them, it's going to be ad hoc, and a lot of them tend to be somewhat gimmicky. Uh, and that's fine. Right? And there's a lot of innovation, innovative ways to do this problem. Um, it's just that, that as someone who, uh, who looks into this, I want a more sort of foundational um, uh, perspective on how to do these things. So the question is, well, is there a foundational way of ensemble information? Uh, and why do we care about foundations? Uh, there's a quote from uh, Dennis Lindley that I find uh, always find interesting is that he 
says that uh, one should have some sort of overall view of the system, whatever it is. Otherwise, every problem, every problem is a new problem. Right? As long as we have this foundational view, uh, uh, any new problem is just a modification or a um, extension of the current problem that you're working with. And that's kind of sort of the, mo the, the, the motif of my uh, research career so far as well. Right? So, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, so the answer to this question, is there a kind of sort of ensembling information, is, is a yes. And that's sort of where my previous research on Bayesian predictive synthesis comes in. Right. And Bayesian predictive synthesis pretty much says that given all the prediction H1 through HJ as called that whole set of H, what we want to get Right. As a decision maker, is what is the quantity y given all the information that I observe from the other people, the other predictions from other people, right? And turns out the predictive distribution here is, is a little bit tricky uh, to deal with in the classical Bayes theorem sense, but there is a version of the Bayes theorem um, developed in the 80s and early 90s that allows you to synthesize information from different agents in a coherently Bayesian way, right? So this, even though it doesn't look like it, is actually the Bayes theorem, just in a modified version, right? And as long as we're following the Bayes theorem, from a Bayesian perspective, we're all good, because that's that's the main thing we care about, right? And in this setup, um, the, the forecasts that we observe, even though we observe them individually, uh, by the notation here, it's clear that um, the assumption that the, the predictions coming in are independent because we treat them as latent factors. This is not actually the case. So I'll give you an example. Uh, imagine you have H1 and H2. Let's just call this uh, Sam and David, right? Sam and David is going to give me predictions about the future, um, and they give me two normal solutions, right? What's what's inflation next month? Um, uh, David says two percent standard deviation, something, and then uh, David uh, Sam says. It's going to be zero. It's nowhere going to be zero percent. So Sam's wrong, but Sam's going to say it's zero percent with like a tighter kind of deviation. So the idea of EPS is that I'm going to treat this as a latent factor, right? So first, I'm going to sample from the distribution. So I'm going to sample from x1 and x2. I'm going to put it into my uh, synthesis function, right? Which is the specification of y given x. From this, I could I, I could learn the combination weights. Right, denoted with the betas here, um, uh, that tries to minimize the, the information that I observe from the agents and the target that I care about y. Right, the interesting because but but because I use a latent factor, what I could do is given this, I could actually calibrate. Right, so given this, I get the predictions of the agents given the data and the parameters, which now is going to be a joint distribution. Right, so it says calibration set. So now I'm recognizing. That Sam and David, although you gave me predictive distributions independently, right? You actually you know, have some common information. You have some you know sit use similar models that kind of stuff. So you're you know, highly dependent on each other. So yeah. So uh, so now I have a joint distribution that takes into account the fact that uh, uh, the, so the combination uh, step. And for the joint distribution, I sample x1, x2 again. And let's repeat this over and over and over and over again. Right? So this is going to help me learn the best way to combine the weight, uh, sorry, combine the predictions, but also it's going to help me learn the predictions, uh, the biases and the dependencies of the predictions in the first place, because I get to treat them as latent factors. Right? So the, the y given x is a key part, part here. This is what we call a synthesis function. It's a conditional specification, and I can put whatever I want in this. Right? And this is the great thing about the flexibility of, of this framework is that depending on how I specify y given x, I could uh, potentially deal with a lot more problems than I so This is what I'm talking about. So the foundational view is that once I have this foundational framework, it's very easy for me to think about other problems because the other problems I could I could cast it within this framework. Sam? What do you need to simplify out so that this is a proper distribution for what Sorry again? Well, uh, so if you want the left hand side to be a proper distribution. Right. Um, what do you need to 
decision about how to put up the tree. I don't know. I don't think you have to. Is there, th there is some conditions here. There is a, so I, I, I it's not in the slides because it's, kind of, it's a little bit of a nuisance, but there is what we call a consistency condition, which, which says that given, given your initial prior about your own predictions and your initial prior about other people's predictions, that they would have to be consistent with that. So the alpha function would have to be, cons would have to be uh, consistent with that. Um, and that would probably ensure that it's probably probability distribution, right? Because on one side, on both sides, have probability distribution. Okay, so, so there is. There is some constraints, yeah. 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 All right, so, um, so far uh, I've done. Uh, for the synthesis function here, um, I could think about time series problems, right? So, so in the applications I've done so far, I have inflation, GDP, COVID, climatology, and insurance data. Um, all these can be thought of as time series problems. So yeah, so for the synthesis function here, right, y given x, I'll just have a dynamic linear model. Right? Dynamic linear model um, where the, the weights, right, the coefficients here uh, uh, change over time, right? And that's going to capture a lot of time variation in the data. Right? So now we have a dynamic latent factor model. Right, and this has worked really well for a lot of time series problems. The second thing that we worked on was all right, let's think about spatial problems, right? Now, instead of thinking about the time dimension, can we think about the spatial dimension, right? And it turns out that if we specify a Gaussian process as a synthesis function, where S is going to be the location of the place, or the location um, of the observation, uh, you have a spatially varying latent factor model, right? And this works well, really well with uh, rent prices and that kind of so ecological data, that kind of stuff. It works really well in that way. So yeah, so so far um, in, in my own research and even some other people's research, this this framework has worked really well in time series problems and spatial problems. The problem is, right, these are all predictive problems. Right? Time series problems, I just have to wait until next month to figure out I did well or not. Spatial problems, I just need to wait until that house is on the market to know if I'm right or not. Right? So there's always going to be a feedback in which I could, I could meet, there's a link between what I want to do and what I'm modeling, right? This is not gonna be the case for the causal inference. Well, this, well, initially we thought it's not gonna be the case for the causal inference problem. Turns out that there's actually a pretty full cool there. Um, so again, there's, there's the three problems, right? There's no clear target to minimize, unlike time series or spatial problems. There's performance heterogeneity, which that's fine actually, uh, and, and that kind of stuff. And we'll go through one by one. So what we actually propose um, is what we call, okay, so, so let's go through a notation real quick. Uh, T is a treatment, it's a binary treatment, right? Either you get treated or untreated or not treated, that's zero and one. I don't care, we care about what the heterogeneous treatment and effect tell. And each agent is gonna produce a distribution of the heterogeneous treatment effect denoted by HJ this is going to be, for this case, let's assume it's a normal distribution with tau hat jx as v and sj squared as its variance, right? So this is a normal distribution um, generated by h from which we can sample fx. Okay. And then the collection of all the h's, all the Frankel distributions that we have, is going to be denoted with mathcal h just like we did before. So this is going to be the BPS uh, setup. This is the, the posterior, right? What is y given all the treatment effects that we observe? And for the synthesis function, what we do is we assign uh, this synthesis function. And I'll go through one by one. So the first component, actually, if you're familiar with the bar literature, this should be immediately uh, sort of analogous, right? So because the first component is the prognostic term, which includes the propensity score, right? Uh, and the second term is a little bit different. This is the combination um, term where we actually combine the heterogeneous treatment effects. Um, so yeah, so it, it, if you're familiar with the BART literature, it's pretty much the same as causal BART, right? Where you have one uh, one causal, uh, so one BART component that models the, the propensity score, and you have one component that models the heterogeneous treatment effect uh, itself. 
right? Same thing. Um, sort of. Similar. So there's an there's an it's analogous in that perspective. They have a two component model: one for agnostic term, second combination term. The combination term itself just look fairly familiar. Um, it's sort it's sort of like a linear regression. And the heterogeneous treatment effect is defined, or the, the synthesized posterior heterogeneous treatment effect is defined as the difference between the expectation of the treated minus the expectation of, uh, or the, uh, of Y, uh, given that it's not treated. And that turns up to be the, the, co the combination term inside, right? Because the prognostic term cancels out, and then T equals either one or zero, so that, that, that clears things up. All right, and in our paper, we propose using a nearest neighbor Gaussian process to estimate the betas and prognostic terms and so forth. Right. So let's go through the problems that I, the three problems that I said earlier, and see whether um, if, if this is getting solved or at least mitigated. Okay. So first, let's go with performance heterogeneity. Right. So as I said before, um, performance heterogeneity is a big problem with HT estimation. Because one model, uh, so one model could be good at modeling one subgroup, but maybe not so in the other subgroup, right? So in this case, we have our beta inside the combination term. The betas are functions of x's because they're Gaussian processes, right? So the beta is going to be a function of x's, uh, and that's going to allow uh, for the difference in the weights, right? So if x is, let's say there's two groups, group one and uh, group zero, um, that beta is going to change based on which group you're, you're in. Right? So it's going to be able to capture that performance heterogeneity. Right? Second problem, high dependence amongst methods issue. Well, as we recall, um, this is actually uh, not much of an issue for us because we're already treating each HTE estimate as a latent factor. So we actually can learn the dependence structure between these HTE estimates and by that, we are actually being able to, to deal with the, uh, the high dependent, dependence amongst models. We're, we're not treating them as independent, right? So finally, so this is where um, things got a little bit complicated. Um, so, so this doesn't actually solve or even give some uh, solution to the no clear target to minimize, right? Because right now what I'm doing is I'm just trying to fit that model to Y, right? And we talked about how fitting the model to Y is not necessarily linked to modeling the causal uh, estimate, right? Uh, and it turns out there is, there is a nice connection there, but it actually took us a lot, a lot longer uh, after all the simulation studies have been done and we figured out it works. We kind of really attend to the theoretical properties of what we're doing, right? Um, so, Turns out that Bayesian causal synthesis actually produces uh, consistent estimates of the heterogeneous treatment effect, right? That's, that's the main theoretical result that we have, right? That as n goes to infinity, our BP, BCS uh, estimate of tau, uh, tau tilt is a notation, will go to the true tau x, right? That's the main theoretical result. Yes. Somewhat. It's in the paper, uh, but I'll, I'll explain what we actually do here to get there because this is not this is not a straightforward task to do because it's not easy because the main problem right is that this is the HTE uh, which is the Gaussian process meaning that this is unidentifiable. Right? This the whole thing is not unidentifiable, right? So we're not actually recovering this at all. Or, yeah. you say that this is the Gaussian process, would you be you fit like beta zero of x and beta j of x and f of j of x, or are you fitting it all in one term? Are you fitting like three separate are you estimating each function separate together? You're fit, okay, okay. Everything is fit, fit, fit fitted together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so a lot of so what people usually do in this context, right? As far as I I, I know it's not a lot, um, is to say like and it's a basic perspective, it would be like posterior conversions of posterior consistency of beta, right? And then say like, yeah, that it, it goes to the true beta, therefore we get the right model, 
right? We can't do that here because this is an identifiable model. So we get nice results, but we don't actually get, um, yeah, well, it's unidentifiable. So it's, it's a little bit tricky to do. So uh, ra so what the solution we came up with, which was to say that rather than prove the consistency of the SMR directly, we're going to prove it through predictive consistency, right? So what I'm saying is that we are not going to be able to prove this guy, tau tilt, the posterior tau, going to the shoe tau as n goes to infinity, but we are able to show that the predicted distribution that we have will go to the true data generating uh, process as, as n goes to infinity. I just have to come up with a question that I can't answer. Yeah, ooh, okay. the, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, well, can you explain what this, this, this last thing is? So you're saying that somehow you have two things which converge in the total variation? Is that what you're saying? I, I, I'm trying to think. So, so no, that's not what you're saying. No. The problem we. So you saw the right. So that's on the left hand side you have the true. So this is what I'm saying. So given n samples, and I'm trying to figure out what the n plus one sample, n, n plus one sample is, right? Okay. So I'm doing a one sort of not leave one out, but like predicting one step ahead. Okay. And then I'm saying on one side, I have my predicted distribution from PCS given the samples that I have in front of me. That's the that's the right. That's the left side. Left side. Uh, okay. <coughs> And the right side is sort of the true distribution that generates um, the data. So, so, so is, it, is this like a generic statement about all the DPS, or is this? No, no, no. This is for this specific. So, so, so we do make assumptions about the data generating process. Um, given, I, I can't recall them exactly in my head, um, but it is in the paper. So I, I did, yeah, yeah. Right. But the idea is that. We could, in terms of the one one step back predictions, as we increase n to infinity, the difference between our predictions from our given model to the predictions of sort of the true data chain process, that will go to zero. Yes? Is that more, is that more like a monkey? What do you mean by that? Um, I, mean, I, do, I do think we get a zoom out of D. Uh, like, do you assume this is an A to an X block as an N? Or do you not think that assumption is not A to an N? No, I think we do. I think we do. Not necessarily assumption, but it's like a property of this. Uh, yeah, but I'm not, I, have to, I have to double check that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is there a reason? So, so is this part of the reason why you use a Gaussian process on each uh, or within this? That is the case, right? That is the case. So it, it does turn out that the Gaussian process is the sort of a, is doing the heavy lifting, right? Uh, not all synthesis methods is going to get you to that, but if you use the Gaussian process, because the Gaussian process is so flexible, right, it does allow you to get sort of uh, under some assumptions, uh, which I'll double check later. Uh, you do actually get that nice consistency. Uh, so I, so I made a, a sort of a more intuitive slide for um, uh, yeah, for non-theoretical person like me, right? So what we're saying is, imagine two worlds where you know, the world where no one's treated, or the world where someone is uh, sorry, a world where someone is not treated t equals zero, and the world where uh, someone is treated t equals one, and then we're doing some predictive tasks in terms of the future. Or, or in terms of new data, right? Um, and the heterogeneous treatment effect is defined um, as this, right? Where the where the heterogeneous treatment effect is going to be the difference between the uh, predictive distributions of uh, y n plus one given t equals one and y n plus plus one given t equals zero, and that difference is the HTE. Um, and so I show is that if if we know that the red part 
converges to the truth, the blue part converges to the truth, then as the HTE is defined as the difference between the two, we indirectly get consistency of the HTE itself. Right. So again, so we're not proving the HTE directly. We're proving through the predictive consistency, HTE consistency. Right. What's our lead by HTE? That the heterogeneous stream in effect, um, as n goes to infinity, goes to the truth. Uh, the, the, so this is all the, theorem, the right? distribution of. Yeah. Yeah. It's the distribution of the truth. Yeah. So it, that's a whole mess, but um, this is why I don't like putting like theorems up on. Um, but I feel like Sam is going to enjoy reading it. So just, but this is, this, as you can see, this is a theorem too, right? The theorem one is the main workhorse, which is to say the theorem one is the one that in the paper proves consistency, predictive consistency under t equals zero and predictive consistency when t equals one. And then given that we can show that there's predictive consistency for those two t equals one and t equals zero, theorem two states if we have that, then we could actually have consistency um, on the difference between the t equals one and t equals zero, which is exactly what, what we mean when we talk about hydrogen power, what we mean about treatment effects. So, so it seems like in this case, the assumption is that. Sure. It, it, it's an implicit note in value, right? Is, is it right? So, so, so conditionally, uh, T and the potential outcome are conditionally. Yeah, yeah. I think so. So, so you're still making kind of a class. Okay. Yeah, I think so. There's, uh, no, no, there's nothing. No, no I, don't, yeah, I don't think we're no deviating way. far from the there's usual no adjustment. Like SUDFA so and ignorability and that kind of stuff is all built to So, so yeah, that's what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, that's great. That's a good question. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess in that, in that sense, yeah, right? Because what we're saying as n goes to infinity, um, whatever we're, the y we're modeling is going to be the y under a complete, uh, perfectly randomized. Yeah. Control trial as well, so I think that's true. I mean, it would have to be true, right? Because we're, that's the definition of the treatment yeah, effect, yeah. right? So, yeah. That makes sense. Read the paper though, because it's over there. Well, it, well, so it seems like a good way to market your paper, then, right? So that, that this is more than just kind of within. Uh, this is potentially, at least from a theoretical point of view, it's more than just within the Bayesian realm, but you, but. Oh yeah, yeah. So we have like nice. Group. So so yeah. So this is. Um, I mean, some would argue this is unnecessary from a Bayesian perspective, right? Because as, as I'll show you later, it works, and that's ultimately what really matters that it works. Um, but well, yeah, I mean, the, the, it was nice. Uh, that's kind of fortuitous, right? Because I, with my collaborators, have been working on theory for the predictive components of BPS for for a long while. Turns out that we could reuse this in the causal framework only if we're in sort of the Rubin causality framework, right? Because, because that is a predictive task, right? Uh, under the Rubin causality model, where you're trying to predict is the potential outcome, right? Not the, and given the outcome, right? So so under only under that framework does this actually kind of work. But we do have some nice uh, uh, theory back from it, um, which I feel like could probably be applied further to other problems as well. We just haven't uh, really looked into it, but yeah, no, it's find it to be an interesting result that we have here. Yeah. Sam, so, seems like you want to ask me a question? No. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. All right. So, so by doing that, right, we actually have this, in this case at least, nice link between what we're doing, which is predicting, and what we want to do, which is to estimate that treatment effect. Right? Because at least we're showing that asymptotically, if we could, uh, asymptotically that we're predicting, the task of predicting is directly connected to how well we actually estimate the treatment. Right? 
So it's not a, a super clear answer to the no clear target to, to minimize, but at least in this context, we're showing that when we're minimizing the thing that we're trying to minimize in this problem, we're actually uh, getting the treatment effect that we care about. Uh, and this is not something I don't think is quite clear in, for example, like stacking, right? Where you're doing cross, uh, leave one out cross validation and minimizing based on like mean squared error. I don't think that's quite clear that what you're doing there is actually going to improve your estimation of the causal effect. All right. So we have a bunch of simulation studies, and I'll run through it, and then we could move into questions or whatever. Um, so we ran a bunch of simulation studies. The first one is a very simple. Uh, so basically we have a DGP, it has two components, the prognostic term and the treatment effect. You get, uh, this should be, right, there's A and B on two sides. Right, yeah, there's A, A for the prognostic term and B for the treatment effect. Sorry, A, B each for prognostic term and treatment effect, and we mix and match, you get two times two, uh, four scenarios out of this. Um, N is 500, uh, and we, we replicated it 100 times. Um, the Asians in our model is going to be the basic causal force. That's the, the, the causal part stuff, uh, basic linear model and a linear additive model. And under this situation, these four scenarios, uh, this is the mean squared error. We highlighted the top two models in, in, in the results. As you can see, uh, ECS is only number two in two of the scenarios. Uh, but does extremely well uh, in most scenarios anyway. Right. So it works, right? Well, it turns out, right, again, so, uh, sorry, the things that we compare compare with is Bayesian causal synthesis, Bayesian causal force, linear model, additive model, um, X learner, which turns out to be pretty good, uh, R learner, which I think is an extension of the causal force stuff, which didn't work at all, causal forest, which didn't work at all, and then there's a CSC, <laughs> it's called causal stacking, which is just taking multiple um, causal models and then doing the one out cross validation. Can you, can you back up a second? Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you pick T? What do you get what? How do you pick, um, how is T generated? I think T's generated randomly. Yeah. I'll double check, but. Okay, so it is, in, in that sense, then it is a randomized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Experiment. I think so. Yeah, good to know. For sure. Um, I'll have to double check that, but I'm mean, not fairly confident in this case. I'll double check. But yeah, so, um, so interestingly enough, BCF is a great method, but it's not always the best method. Which makes sense, right? And then and you can actually see when you have higher dimensions than D, it actually doesn't do as well as some of the other methods. Uh, but yeah, overall it does really well. Um, and here are the 95% intervals. Uh, BCF is great, right? BCF or basically called the forest gets very, very close to 95% most of the time, except when you have high dimensions, right? Uh, BCS is a close second, um, but it maintains sort of good quality even when you have high dimensions. And here's sort of a graph of like two examples that I have. Um, if I look at the right, we have the mean squared error. BCS is all the way in the left. Um, yeah, it does uh, really well across the board. Um, if you look at the intervals, this is the coverage probability is on the x-axis, and the interval length is in the y-axis. And because we do 100 replications, I plotted also the 95% um, the intervals of those. Uh, and then you can see BCS and BCF both do really, really well um, under senior, scenario 1, P equals 30. But for scenario 3, P equals 90, which is the high dimensional stuff, um, BCF does struggle. And you can see the struggle by looking at how much um, how large the 95% intervals are uh, for these experiments. Um, here's a quick plot of all the stuff with 95% intervals of BCS. Um, but you know, most of the methods do, do fairly well, I would say. Um, although as you get closer, or as, as the, the HT, the true HT gets larger, you get sort of more discrepancies going on. Uh, interestingly, uh, when the HT is, is, is large, we tend to have larger interval length for BCS, right? Which I think captures the more, the bigger, the bigger effect, bigger uncertainty kind of thing. Uh, I think that captures this, this, this graph captures that fairly well. Although, I'm sorry that the, the orange and red are probably a little bit harder to discern um, on the, the, the slides. 
Okay. So that's nice, but it's simulation studies that we built, right? And you should never trust simulation studies that you build yourself, right? Because you could always, like, I could have had hundreds of simulation studies that didn't work, and the four that I worked, I reported, right? It could be. So what we did was we went back to the ACIC stuff uh, for 2017. Uh, they had a bunch of scenarios. We just picked the eight, the eight hardest ones, right? Um, and this was based on the paper. We're not saying this is the eight that worked well, right? This is the eight that was hardest that was on the paper, and then we used that to replicate. And again, n equals 500. Uh, we replicated 100 times. Same model, same setup. Everything's pretty much the same. Uh, and this was very impressive. Um, the Bayesian cost synthesis is the best model in terms of mean squared error across um, everything. Right. So this is the bold isn't the, the, the only the best one, uh, and the 95% coverage probability of these tests is really really good. Um, it's actually uh, within 2% difference from 95% for for this case. Even if uh, BCF could, it sometimes doesn't work as well. It's around mostly around 90% in terms of the coverage probability. Um, sometimes dipping down to like 70%. Um, gonna, again, this is like the eight hardest scenarios so that kind of makes sense. Um, BCS, though, gets really close to 95% really well. Um, causal forest, I don't understand why it exists when it has 42% coverage. I mean, it's pretty, pretty miserable, I would say. Uh, but yeah, right, so this is just, I, you know, I'm not saying this is the end all be all, but we do think that this is a really good indicator that at least empirically, this seems to work really, really well. And here's the same graph that I made earlier. Uh, CF, BCF, BCS. BCS is almost always on 95% uh, nominal rate. Uh, the mean squared error also really, really good. So yeah, so I mean, this is, this, this, this is, seems like a good result for us. All right. Okay, and then I have 10-ish more minutes, so I say, all right, good, yeah. all right. So that's good. Um, so we also then stole from the Bayesian causal forest paper on the application. Uh, we're looking at the, the effect of smoking on medical expenditures, a bunch of uh, stuff. Um, and well, here are the results that we have. It's nice to interpret. So for example, uh, age and year split pretty much, or at least age, the HD estimation between ECS and everything else, pretty consistent, pretty consistent the same. Uh, you see a pretty big difference between um, BCS and everything else for the smoke age, as you can see. So that kind of makes sense, right? Because the smoke age is uh, smoke age. Smoke age was oh, did I copy it wrong? I think it did. Smoke, smoke age is like, I think when did you start smoking? I think it's, right. So there aren't a lot of people who are 60 and above who started smoking at 60 and above, right? That's not, you know, usually start when you're young. So you see a lot less data, right, in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And that seems, you see that, right? And you see that uncertainty sort of difference, not uncertainty, you see that um, difference between all the other methods that we consider, right? And if you look at the weights between the models of BCS, this captures as well, right? So the intercept, right? There's, remember, there's an intercept in the BCS combination component. The intercept is going to capture whatever uncertainty the model, the rest of the models can capture. So I call it model, like model set uncertainty, right? So the uncertainty that all the models can capture gets captured by the intercept. So the intercept is a good indicator of how much uncertainty there exists as a whole, given all the models that you have. And as you can see here, as smoke gauge goes up, the intercept goes, sky, skyrockets up, right? That's because there's a lot more uncertainty uh, in there. And that captures that well. Um, the age and, and year split is a little bit harder story to tell. Uh, I'm sure if you ask someone who works on this data more specifically, they'll give you Maybe there's more good interpretations that can be done there. But, um, but from our perspective, this is kind of nice enough to highlight that, that, that BCS is capturing what it's supposed to capture, including model set uncertainty. And you can see like a change in model. Right? So that's the performance heterogeneity I was talking about. That depending on uh, the x and where you are on the x, right, 
you can see different performance. The best model is not always the same across the board. Right, that's nice. All right, um, so this is usually, this is sort of where my talk's done, uh, but recently, uh, so we got a little bit interested in a small N study uh, because of an experiment that we're running. Uh, it turns out, this is probably not super surprising to sort of the BARC people, is that when there's small data points, there's not a lot of data points, uh, something as flexible as BARC doesn't fit as well because you just don't have enough data to, to fit a flexible. Uh, function. And you actually see that in small data, right? Uh, so BCS doesn't always do well, but but the additive model actually does really well because of its strong restrictions on, on, the, on the form. Uh, but BCF actually does uh, fairly poorly in this situation. Okay. This, is, this is rather an important point, right? Because you really don't know, given the scenario, given the context that you're in, how many data samples that you have, which should you use, right? Clearly, BCF shouldn't be used every single time everywhere. I mean, unless you're very good at tuning it, right? Um, sometimes something as strict of an assumption as an additive model actually does better in certain scenarios. BCS is able to capture the difference in those scenarios well. It perform at least as good as whatever is the best, and sometimes a lot better. Um, and that you can actually see here. And you can see that the additive model actually has a very, very poor coverage probably with 67%, 71%. Um, BCS does recover the proper, the correct nominal percentage like around 95%. So finally, um, we have, we've been running this experiment, uh, which I find very, very interesting with some economists. They, they are interested in um, the, they're interested in reactions to patent waivers. Right. So remember with COVID, they waived uh, patents for uh, vaccines. And so we asked, we, had, we built this uh, big experiment where we were asking R&D companies, R&D startups, whether the fact that their countries are doing patent waivers, is that going to affect your motivation to do research? Pretty much. Right. And we only have 80 data points. Right. We asked, we asked like a thousand companies. And like maybe ten percent responded, so like we have it's very small n, right? And then and then we're looking at heterogeneity between um, people who do applied research and people who do uh, more fundamental research. All right. And it turns out that with our result, we should say that applied research is a little bit downward motivation, but not significantly. But people who do fundamental research actually got more motivated right? after the patent waivers. I don't know why, but they do feel very very motivated. To do more research after that. And if you look at the difference between the applied research and the fundamental research, there's a significant difference there. And that's something noteworthy we can talk about. But if you look at the basic causal force, it's pretty much a straight line, right? It's pretty much a straight line, which, which means that it's not capturing any of the heterogeneous uh, the treatment effect in this case. And there's a lot of reasons why that could be, but I, it could be that there's actually no effect and we're actually capturing noise. But it does seem like um, uh, under these, con these contexts, uh, given a small n, uh, more flexible methods do struggle a little bit, and this kind of uh, is a good example of that. All right, so just to wrap up a little bit, uh, so our basic idea is that we want to estimate HCEs, but HCEs have model and circuit, model and specification associated with it, so we've developed basic causal synthesis that ensemble these HCE estimates. Uh, it improves accuracy and mitigates uncertainty. It captures the performance energy as you want it. It, uh, it learns, it's typo, estimation dependence, and we actually get nice, consistent, nice theoretical guarantee in terms of the consistent estimate of HTD. And you know, there's a lot of directions where we could take this, um, including the application experiments that I talked to a little bit. Uh, but yeah, but as I said earlier, you know, when we were trying to think about if you want to call it meta inference or super inference, I mean, one clear application we can think about is can this be applied like meta analysis more in general? That kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, and so we're kind of excited about this direction of research. Um, here are a bunch of papers, uh, including my earlier works that I've cited in this paper. Uh, but the, the paper on Bayesian call synthesis is now on archive. Um, we archived it just for this seminar. I don't know. I would, it would have taken until next year if it wasn't for the Senate ourselves. Though. 
Uh, but right now, we're also trying to develop at least some kind of code that people could use, um, ideally with all the underlying models as well. So you just press one button, and it'll get you the, P, the BCF linear model, additive model, and then it'll combine them together to give you the PCS outcomes um, pretty much automatically. So that's kind of what we're working right now. Uh, yeah, that's my talk. So you did show, and I think on, on the in the simulate or not the, the real data analysis that last, you you are learning um, for each individual treatment effects. Yeah. But I'm thinking that the, so I'm just trying to square this with the theoretical statement that you make that that the theory says that you can learn the distribution, but it doesn't say anything about the the individual. Is that it learns? Um, it learns the function tau x. Okay, right. So I think that would include the okay, okay. So then that would include the yeah, yeah. 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 I'll double check that. Okay. Thanks. Let's make it again. <laughs> <laughs>